Thank you very much, Tim. Thanks for giving me this opportunity to speak. Um, <clears throat> now, Tim wanted me to talk about how to tip socio-technical change. Well, unfortunately, I don't know the answer. <laughs> and I would say lots of people would like to know how to do this. And I do work with policymakers in London, in Brussels, for example. And so if I knew the answer, of course, I would have told people. Um, instead, I'm going to talk about uh, how perhaps I see the economy as part of a large evolutionary system that is within the Earth system. And what gives it inertia with respect to change? Because we would like to see change. So the economy loves change, but it also can't handle it. <clears throat> OK, so I'll start with this picture from um, the Bank of England. So I'm just going to talk about the economy. Now, in 2015, um, Mark Carney, um, who you will have heard of, uh, started this interesting, odd debate about risks in the financial sector, warning of the a new set of risks that people were not discussing before to um, investors and insurers. And what he was saying is that if we don't address climate change, there will be enormous physical risks affecting assets, things we uh, think have value. But if we do um, transition, there are also a new set of risks, which he called transition risks. Uh, this is if we transition very rapidly. It's not to say that the Bank of England would support some sort of midway transition. That's not at all the case. It's really a question of informing what's, what's ahead and what's coming. The economy doesn't like transitioning very rapidly. Um, more recently, we've had um, the 1.5 report by the IPCC, which has been very influential policy-wise. And this suggests a very rapid transition to, to low carbon. And after that, we've had policy changes in the UK. For example, net zero in 2050 appears to be the new objective. And other parts of Europe are following this. So this suggests a very rapid change. But where is the source of inertia in the economy? Well, here's a view of the lifetime of most of the stuff, the physical stuff we have in the economy. I should thank uh, Andy Jarvis for this. Um, <clears throat> You see that there's a mean of around 40, 30, 40 years, which you could translate to a rate of return in the economy of 3% per year. But you can see some things last for a very long time, and we have trust in these assets that they will produce. Now, this is associated also with another distribution, which is the distribution of, of payback times, the time over which stuff needs to last in order to generate return. If the lifetime becomes shorter than the payback time, then um, we begin to have losses in the financial sector. And losses, are, nobody wants that. Now, the question is whether the economy is able to go around the bend. That really is Andy Jarvis' uh, expression again. Um, <clears throat> what happens if it does go around? What happens if it doesn't go around? And what, what's, what's really in involved? And I should say, the financial sector is really that big brain. It's a big, scale-free network, complex network which I study, it transmits distress as well as uh, uh, well, negative and positive signals across the economy. Um, when there's distress, it propagates like a disease in there. And you will have seen that in 2007, 2008. When something's in trouble somewhere, it transmits that all over the place. And then all of a sudden, everybody's in trouble. So this is an inherently unstable system. Has the economy seen this before? Well, yes. In very much in the same spirit as Tim and Andy's uh, revolutions that made the Earth, the economy has gone through these revolutions, of course, at a completely different time scale. Um, each of these revolutions, what's interesting about them is that they generate lot, generated lots of activity across the economy, but also in between them, there has been social and financial and economic instability every time. Now we're moving on to a new uh, set of uh, activity developing. You can see this reflected in the uh, amounts invested in various sectors in the economy at the moment. And you can see that, say, biotech is really the leading sector at the moment. And it goes, this order here is the backwards order of this here. 
So things that were developed earlier have less investment nowadays. That's sort of intuitive. So socio-technical change happens all the time. Now the question would be, are we now in a socio-technical transition with respect to the low carbon, a potential low carbon economy? Well, some people might say yes, it's difficult to tell, but certainly there is change. And you can see this, this is the International Energy Agency's data. The two highest emission sectors, um, power generation and transportation, do see changes at the moment. Now, change in technology generates instability in the economy. So is this going to generate instability? So some of us have done work on this, and what would it mean? So it would mean that lots of the stuff in which there is currently a lot of value could become devalued. And this ultimately is owned by, say, yours and mine, uh, pension fund ultimately, and lots of uh, different uh, parts of the financial sector across the economy. And we're talking about a lot of long-lived physical infrastructure that would have to be devalued very rapidly. Um, for example, you, you can look at this thinking in terms of um, scenarios. So when somebody invests into stuff, they look at a future that they can imagine, right? They will have return on this future, and if the future turns out to be something completely different that is realized, then you could have here that's been called unburnable carbon, and there you could have a loss. The, you, you take the two multiplied and some, you could have an idea what the, what the value loss could be. And this can be quite large, so some of us have done this work, which has had a bit, I've made a bit of noise last year. Um, <clears throat> here we calculated what could be the uh, value loss in uh, fossil fuels in the current tra trajectory of the economy, as well as what is required for reaching the policy goals, right? And we get something that is between one and four trillion dollars. So this, that is large enough to generate a financial crisis if we compare back to 2007. I should just say, this is the accumulated loss up to 2035, and these large bars, the blue ones, are the accumulated change in GDP. Some nations are exporters, some nations are importers of fossil fuels, so the loss is not distributed equally. And you can see in this picture, I think, all of the current geopolitics around the world. So this is, in large part, what is preventing the transition from happening. But think of it, lots of people work in these sectors, lots of people are involved, so it's people's livelihoods. So it is not just people not having the right values, but it's also a question of how the world is changing, who is affected. So just as a concluding slide, uh, there's a lot of talk about divestment, and is this a method to generate socio-technical change? To, to tip so, social technical change. So first, I'll say something quite controversial here. I would say that what investors are telling me when I talk to them is divestment is not really the solution because if you, if say the Church of England decides that it doesn't have any more fossil fuels on its balance sheet, some, someone else will buy that. It's always going to be around still until it's devalued to, to zero, until it's stranded. So, but what is the solution? There is new policy coming, almost certainly, regarding financial transparency. That's a big debate that's happening with, uh, between central bankers. And <clears throat> what that might generate is a new framework for people to evaluate what is the content of carbon in financial assets in companies when they decide what to invest in. And that gives a strong information signal. That is different. Um, and I would just say that even if not the whole world adheres to this, it is likely that it's, I think, going to propagate because as soon as some people do adopt these rules of uh, transparency, uh, in order to trade in certain markets, others have to join up and uh, disclose similarly. So this may be a way in which actually socio-technical -tec change could happen. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, JF, and thanks for keeping to time. Ollie first, and who else has got a question for me, just to help me out?
So we'll go up there. That was, thank you, Jean-François. That was a, a wonderful presentation. I wanted to ask you about transition risks. Um, if companies reveal through disclosure very large transition risks, doesn't that make more evident their um, interest in lobbying against transition? Yes, well, <clears throat> I think if companies have enormous risks, they shouldn't be around, really. So I think, so they could, and, and then it depends on policymakers how much they want to risk the stability of the system or whether they are happy to let these things go. And then decisions need to be taken, like in 2007, which banks can continue and which banks don't continue. And I wouldn't go any further into any normative di discussion about whether they should or not. <laughs> Question up there. Hi, thanks for a great talk. I just wanted to give, give an example. I think, you know, I think some of this is not in the future, it's happening already. And if you listen to the radio this morning about the massive drop in investment into the automotive industry, um, with worries of Brexit and so on, you know, that, that's ha it's happening already, I think, with our traditional industries. <laughs> Brian, yeah, it's can thanks. I just got a question, please? Just thanks for a, a fascinating talk. I put so many thoughts in my head. I'm just think, I was thinking about that graph of the um, techno-economic waves um, that you had, the graph that you had of the techno-economic waves. And, uh, I mean, in a way, the 1970s is a really interesting time, isn't it? Because, um, you know, it's I IT is supposed to be the new wave, which will keep the profit rates. You know, as the old technologies are, are losing their ability to give um, super profits, then um, you, you move to a new techno, you know, so investment moves into the new technology. And as you'll know from Robert Gordon's work and others, you know, there's the arguments that actually IT didn't bring any uh, profits. And, and the, the way that the way that the economy kept growing was by financialization on the one hand and re-spatialization of production using old technologies to China. So did we miss the opportunity to transition to a genuinely new form of production in the 1970s and now it's catching up with us? Um, I think the, the structure is recurrent. So the, the, the bubble above the, the financial sector, well, above the real economy in the financial sector has, has happened pretty much every one of these waves. You've had the, the, the railway mania, you've had the canal mania, you've had a, a financial crisis every time, actually. So this is quite well documented. I don't think, now the, the economy is larger, so obviously the bubble is much larger, but I don't think it's really particularly any different from any of the previous transitions that, that have happened. And I, I don't venture too much into normative thinking regarding this, because I think a lot of it's deeply endogenous in the way that it, the, the economy transforms itself in a very evolutionary way, really. So I, I, I don't know whether we can say in the 70s we, we've done some, some, something wrong. And nowadays, what, what we would see happen, a lot of it would be, again, endogenous in the way things would transform with artificial intelligence and uh, biotechnology. And of course, we can control some of it, and we can limit the way to which there would be a large bubble forming above the real economy. But again, I think a lot of it's endogenous. Not everything's, I think we ascribe too much agency to policymakers. So, sure. There's a question up there. Although divestment might not get rid of current assets, um, does it reduce the incentive for investment in new fossil fuel assets? Yeah, so reclassifying uh, uh, fossil fuel assets as junk essentially uh, increases the, 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 the interest rate that's given to these types of things. So they become, the finance becomes more expensive, so it discourages investment there. But uh, the price of finance is not the only thing that determines investment because effectively um, there's a certain learning by doing in, in the financial sector, there's a new paper about this, where effectively what the financial sector has been used to investing in and managing, when that's changing, the financial sector is, hesitates somehow. So it, they might still want to have these types of assets on their balance sheets, the banks for example, uh, because if they don't have fossil fuels, they, they don't know what to replace that risk return profile by, and we, there isn't really anything that replaces it at the moment. And so I think there's a desire for having this sort of asset, and if we, if we make them become junk, I think it creates a bit of chaos. But of course we have to do it, so there needs to be a restructuring of the whole way we do finance, probably. 
I'm sorry, folks, this started a great discussion, but we've got to move on. Uh, Stefan is our next speaker to get mic'd up. Let's thank Jean-François again. <laughs>